All right, guys. Welcome to PacWest Bigfoot. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, tonight, I've got Brian Hunter on here. And Brian actually has, uh, uh, I believe you have um, shared your encounter uh, elsewhere, I think, online. Yeah, I have. I, I, was, uh, <clears throat> I was on Sasquatch Chronicles a Sasquatch. while back. Shared it with Wes on there. Gotta love Wes. And, and then I guys. met you. Oh, yeah, they're awesome guys. And then I met you at Beachfoot, and you wanted me to come on your show, so I said, no problem. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So real quick, um, before we get started and let Brian take over here, just to let you know, I've got um, some of the giveaways here for this month. we got the SCSO members T-shirt from the uh, Southern California Sasquatch organization. You guys can find them on their uh, Facebook page as well. And <clears throat> some really awesome little cards, little greeting cards that were drawn up by by a really awesome lady, Robin Hyatt, and she's got uh, some great, there's three cards in here, plus I put a little uh, Sasquatch sticker there in the back for you. So that's uh, gonna be uh, <clears throat> the uh, giveaway for this month. So awesome, awesome, awesome. Don't forget, if you guys want to, uh, I don't do any donations for the show anymore. If you guys want to, you can check out uh, mypackwestbigfoot.com, mypackwestbigfoot.com, grab a coffee mug, grab a t-shirt, grab whatever. And that is how everything's supported here. So with that, uh, first, real quick, want to say thank you so very much to everybody that has ever helped out here from, <clears throat> you know, you authors out there, William and uh, uh, Mrs. Betty and uh, um, let's see, uh, who else? Um, Sasquatch Coffee. Um, yeah, the Sasquatch Coffee Company. Uh, Folklore Supply. Thank you guys so very much. Uh, Southern California Sasquatch Organization. All you guys for everything that you guys do here. So awesome. With that. Let's be done with all that craziness. Let's get in here. <clears throat> Brian, are you there? I am. Sweet. So uh, real quick, your um, experiences happened where? My experiences happened, uh, both of them up on the, I'm going to think about this for a second. It's up on the west side of Mount Hood. It'd be the southwest side of Mount Hood is where my experiences happened at. Okay. Uh, one of them happened back in 88, 87 or 88. I can't remember the exact date. It was the winter. I know that much. Mm -hmm. And then the other one happened in the late fall of 2013, mm -hmm. both in the same area. Okay. All right. So why don't so, you walk mm -hmm. us through the first one and uh, take your time. Uh, tell us what you were doing that day, um, what led you to that point, and what you saw, heard, and uh, felt. <laughs> So basically, uh, there was a place up on the southwest side of Mount Hood, and it was called uh, Weber Road. Mm -hmm. And for people that are familiar with the, I'd say, the east side of Portland, leaving Gresham going towards Mount Hood, there used to be a candy farm up there called the Oregon Candy Farm. Oh, yeah. And the road, the road directly past that was Weber Road. And it used to be open to ride dirt bikes up there. I remember, that, I think the first time I went up there was probably 85, 86. And I rode up there all the way until they shut it down in 92. And uh, it's too bad they shut it down because people were polluting up there. And it was pretty sad. But mm. I think that's why they shut it down. Needless to say, we rode up there for quite a few years. And um, when I was up there in the winter of 87 to 88, it was either December or January. I know it was right around that time frame. Anyhow, there was a group of us that were up there riding that day. Uh, one of my friends I was riding with was from Arkansas, and he happened to move up here only because his dad got transferred from the Reynolds aluminum plant in the uh, winter of 87, or actually the spring of 87 when they shut it down. Uh, so he transferred up here to the Oregon Reynolds aluminum plant, and then Chad and I met in school and started riding dirt bikes together as well. And the day we were up there riding, it was... Uh, it was bad weather day. It was snowing out. And uh, as we were up there riding, um, I remember, and I got to go into this detail a little bit, but Chad's family was never the, I would say, the well-to-do family with money and all that stuff. So they kind of scratched and scraped for what they could get. And they got Chad a older Yamaha 125. And every time we were riding, that bike was always breaking down. It was something, either flat tire broken clutch cable it just it was just a breakdown bike but the point behind it all was Chad got a chance to get out and ride dirt bikes and have fun so that was more of the point than anything else 
Anyhow, and the day we're up there riding, my bike happened to break down that day, and my dad let me ride his bike. So Chad and I decided to go for a ride on our own, and we were basically taking uh, a round trip. It was kind of like about a five-mile loop we were going to take. And in the process of taking that five-mile loop, we had a couple little, you know, Ys and forks we come to, and we take lefts and rights, and we knew where to go. We rode it there so many times. And as we were on the last stretch, probably about a mile and a half, two miles left, getting ready to come back, we were coming to the fork and road where we take a left, and then it starts to drop down this little finger off the side of a, a hillside. And as we were coming down there, after you take a left at this fork, it would wind you take a couple little S turns and that would go into uh, probably about a 75 yard straightaway before it started turning again on little S curves to go down on this finger on the side of this hill. And as we came, I came around this last corner before we came into the clearing or the little straightaway. And I look back and, and mind you, it's snowing on the ground. And I look back as you know, as we rode as companions back then, we always want to make sure that we have our partner with us. I look back and Chad's not there. And I thought, well, this is crazy. And then I thought, well, Chad's bike probably broke out again. So I shut my dad's bike off because that was the next thing you usually do is you shut your bike off to see if you can hear somebody coming. <clears throat> and I shut my bike off, and there's no sign of Chad. <clears throat> so I ended up waiting there for a second, and as soon as I did, all of a sudden, I see Chad pushing his bike around the corner. And I thought, yeah, his bike broke out again, so this ought to be a fun joy for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> and he catches up to me as he's pushing his bike in about, I'd say, six to eight inches of snow. And uh, he tells me, he says, hey, man, he goes, my bike didn't break down. I ran out of gas. And I was like, oh, that's, first of all, lovely. Second of all, that's an easy fix. We'll just ride back to the truck, get a can of gas, come back, and you're good to go. And he said, well, what do I do with my bike? And once again, this goes back to the story of Chad not having a real decent bike. I said, put your bike in the ditch in the snow, and we'll go back to the truck and get your gas tank or a can of gas. Throw you up and you'll be good. And he says, well, what if someone steals my bike? And I said, Chad, no one's going to steal your 1974 125 Yamaha. No offense, but it's kind of an old piece of crap. No one's going to want this thing. And we we're just making fun. I was making fun out of it, you know. And <laughs> so finally, he he, puts, he he starts pushing it off in the ditch off to the right of me. Well, off to the left-hand side of me, I can clearly see down uh, in, the, in the little finger, or I say like a little miniature hillside canyon we're getting ready to ride down into. And at the bottom of it, this little hillside, uh, they just started, or they actually already did some clear cutting and they had fresh planted trees in there that were like little baby Douglas firs down in there is what it looked like to me. And these Douglas firs were probably about a good, I'd say 20, 30 yards on each side of the road. Mm -hmm. And to give you a better picture of, of the area, if you went down all the way to the bottom of this little finger that took about three or four little S turns to get down to the bottom. And once you got down to the bottom, you're heading directly east for about probably a mile back to the truck. So we were that close to the truck. And on the last, probably the last part of the straightaway, once you got down there, it was probably, I'd say, a 16th of a mile. And then it went into a thick of the trees. And you probably had to ride through about three quarters of a mile with no light at all, uh, no daylight shining through, only because it was just like an umbrella of trees. And in that open area right there, where the logging road we're getting ready to go down onto, probably had a patch of grass about seven to ten feet on each side, and then that's where the baby tree started after that little patch of grass did. And we thought they were like four to five feet tall, and then it was about 20 or 30 yards going up the hill north from where our standpoint was, and then it went into like the older girls, you know, the 50 to 70 foot tall trees that they had not clear cut it yet. And anyhow, as we were I was sitting there looking down where we're getting ready to ride, I noticed this bear come walking out of the tree line. And Chad, being from Arkansas, I figured he'd never seen a bear before. I've never been to Arkansas, so I didn't know what kind of wilderness Arkansas had. And I told Chad, I said, hey, you ever seen a bear before? Because this is my first time seeing one as well. I was only 13 years old. And uh, Chad said, no. And I said, well, hurry, put your bike in the ditch. Get up here. I'm looking right at one. So he put his bike in the ditch. And as he was doing that, I decided to put the kickstand down on my dad's bike so I could stand up and get a better perspective of where I was at. And when you ride logging roads up here in the Northwest, we get lots of rain, so they like to round the logging roads. So if it rains, the water runs off, and it doesn't flood the logging roads for the loggers up there. Well, I was on the downside, and my dad kicks down, and his bike was real long. So every time I kept trying to put the bike down, it kept wanting to fall over. So I got off the bike, and I went to push it up towards the center of the logging road. 
Chad being off to the right of me, which would have been myself, was putting his bike in the ditch. And as I was trying to wrestle my dad's bike, Chad finally came to the top of the road and, uh, he, he looked up at, at, at me and then looked down the direction we were going where I said where the bear was at. And I never forget the words that came out of his mouth with the southern draw. Cause he, said, he said, hey, man, that, that ain't no bear down there. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I ended up getting my dad's bike on the kickstand. And as soon as I did, I looked down in the direction where I saw the bear. And what I thought was the bear was no longer a bear. It was something that was standing up on two legs and it was walking like a man. And I seen it come out of the tree line and where I seen this thing come out of the tree line, um, it had probably made it through that little grassy patch just halfway through that seven to 10 foot area of grassy patch before it got to the road. When Chad saw it, it was already out the road. When I looked at it, it was taking a step to go into the center of the road. And then with one more step that it already cleared the whole road and went into the next little grassy patch, a section that was on the other side of the logging road. We watched it take one more step and then it hit that baby tree line and it, its shoulders and neck were pretty much above the tree line as it walked through this, I'd say 20, 20 to 15 to 20 yards. You know, it's been so long, I'm not exactly great with uh, distance, but it was, I think, 15 to 20 yards of fresh baby furs that were on the ground and it was completely head and shoulder above the whole time and then it got into the thicket of the trees and then it just disappeared. And Chad and I looked at each other, and we said, we are not going down that direction. It scared the crap out of us. And we said, we're going back the other way. We're taking the long way back. And mind you, at this time, it was snowing pretty heavily as well. Mm-hmm. So you got two scared 13-year-old boys that want to get the hell out of Dodge. And we jumped on the bike, fired up, went back the opposite way. And when we got back to the truck, we ended up telling everybody what we saw. And they, they were laughing at us, saying, oh, you guys just saw a bear. And uh, we said, okay, well, let's go back to the area. I said, we told them, you can go back to the area. We're not going to go with you, but we'll tell you exactly where it's at, and we'll tell you where Chad's bike's at, so you guys can gas it up and ride the bike back. We don't want to go back there. Well, my dad and my other buddy's dad that was down there ended up talking all of us into loading up and going that direction. And when we got back there, it was snowing pretty heavily, so there wasn't a lot of you know definition in the tracks, but you could clearly see the tracks were big. And I'd say the stride of this thing was, I remember being over five feet. It was close to six feet. It was six to seven feet is what the stride was on this thing. And when my dad and my buddy's dad ended up walking into the tree line to try to follow these tracks, what we thought was four to five feet tall trees, these trees are anywhere from seven to eight feet tall because my dad's 5'11", my dad's buddy was six foot one or six foot two, and the trees were clearly almost a foot above the bulk of them when they walked into the tree line. So and Chad and I looked at each what, other. Over nine feet tall? I would say between nine and ten feet tall is what we saw. Whew. It's huge. Somewhere in that neck of the woods. It was huge. It was big. And, and the thing I remember most about it was when it was when it was on all fours and it was walking like a bear, it appeared to me that it was a bear. It was very narrow. It was very skinny. Because, you know, and, and mind you, we were probably we were every bit of at least 200 yards away from the creature when we saw it. Mm-hmm. From, from where our standpoint was to the to the area we had to travel down to. Mm-hmm. And when we when we got down there, uh, like I said, when we, when we finally got down there, what we thought were four to five feet tall trees were at least seven to eight feet tall. And we were just blown away. I mean, me and Chad looked at each other, and we were like, the first words out of our mouth were like, no way, this thing is, this thing is way bigger than what we thought of. Like, this thing was a monster. You know, and, and, and I can tell you that, after that episode happened, every single time me and Chad went riding back up in that area, we would never go riding through that section of trail unless there was at least a minimum of four or five of us together. We just never wanted to do it by ourselves at all. It was just, you know, you see something like that and it's up there, it scares the crap out of you, to be quite frank with you, you know? Well, yeah, actually, 200 yards is not that far away. Um, it's not that far away at all, <laughs> you know? No, uh, it's not. That's, uh, that is insane. That's insane. Uh, what, yeah, what it was big. Did this thing, was it like black, brown? It was black. I don't recall it being any other color than just black. And what I wanted to say, too, was that when it was down on all fours and I seen it looking like a bear, it was very narrow. When it stood up, it was so wide. When I was looking at it, I couldn't pay attention to nothing else but the width of its shoulders. I mean... Mm-hmm. I was looking at a complete monster and, and to give the audience and anybody else a better perspective, 
of how wide it really is. I, I would literally take your average luxury car, like let's say a Toyota Camry. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to me like the shoulders were as wide as the rooftop was. I mean, it was just huge. It was monstrous. I couldn't get over how wide this thing was. It, it, well, you know, looking back on it, the more, the more I recollect, because I've had a lot of time to recollect on this thing, it had to be four feet, if not wider. It was just so wide. And I could never get out of my head is how could it be down on all fours as thin, as thin and narrow as a bear and then stand up and its shoulders are that massive and wide. It just, to this day, I can't understand how it was like that, but it was that because I saw it. I saw it with my own two eyes. Jeez. So that, that was pretty much the first encounter. That was mm-hmm. the only encounter I've ever really seen it. I've had other experiences out in the wilderness. A couple of them I can't account for. Uh, but, but that was the only one that I've ever actually seen was that one right there. And it was just, it was a monster. That's all I can say. And to this day, I went down and saw Chad here about two years ago back in Arkansas. We try to get together every every so often to say hi to one another because he's back in Arkansas now. When I went down there to see him, it was funny. I, he picked me up in the airport and I got in his truck and he said, well, how's Oregon been? And one of the things I asked him was, I, I got down there, it was April, April and May I went down there. It was 70 degrees and like 90% humidity. I've been down there once before and I told Chad, I said, man, does it ever not humid down here? And he says, hey, man, I ain't seen you in 20 years. And that's the first words out of your mouth, not hello, how you doing? And so we get in this truck, and he says, you do any more Bigfoot hunting up there? He says, because I ain't coming up there to go with you. And I was like, no. I said, I've been out a couple times, but I said, I ain't been back to Weber Road since and since they shut it down. So huh. we still talk about it once in a while. We get on the phone. And, you know, they've even got Bigfoot encounters down there. And I asked Chad if he's had anything going on down there. And he says, no, he ain't heard of nothing. He ain't seen nothing. And Yeah. To him, it's supposed to be a myth down there, but he knows what he saw up here. Funny thing about it is, he laughs about it, but when we sit down and really talk about it, he doesn't like getting into detail about it too much because I didn't realize when when I was down there two years ago visiting him, he told me, so then he goes, that day, he goes, you never know what fear really is until you see an actual monster in front of you. You really don't know what fear is until you have an experience like that. And he goes, I felt fear that, he goes, every time you and I went riding through there, he goes, I was full throttle. I just wanted to get to that area as fast as possible. It just always scared yeah. him as much as it scared me. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's, that's huge, dude. <laughs> that's monstrous huge. So the, yeah, it was the monstrous second, big. So give us a, tell us a little bit about the second experience. Well, the second time was back up in the same spot and it was fast forward with that, uh, about, I'd say, 22, 23 years later from 1987, 88 to 2013. Well, a company called Longview, either Longview Fiber or Longview Timber, they opened it up only for hunting season and woodcutting season. It was always from like the 1st of October till the 1st of November. And you can get yourself a five core permit for wood really cheap and go up there and hack away. And basically what you're hacking on is all their slash piles. They would uh, they do clear cuttings up there and allow people you know that were uh, I believe close as neighboring individuals or whatever to get wood permits to go up there and cut wood. Well, I was always able to get one of these wood permits and go up there and cut wood. And it was like I believe it was October, uh, late October, and me and a friend decided to go up there and get our last bit of wood. And I took my son with me, and we ended up going up there. Uh, that day, I don't know if it was a Saturday or Sunday, and it was early in the morning because we were going to get a bunch of wood. And we got up there probably about, I think about 6.30 in the morning we got up there. And from where I had my first encounter, and now mind you of this, my my buddy knew about my first encounter, and, he, and, and my other friend, he always laughed about this. He's like, yeah, there ain't no such thing as Bigfoot. And I was like, okay, whatever. Some people, you just can't try to talk anything about with them because they're just non-believers, and they think you're a fool, but it is what it is. So we went up there cutting wood, and we were probably about a good five or, I don't know, five or seven miles on the other side of where I had my first encounter. Now, I had to drive past the area where my first encounter was at to get back where the wood cutting signs were. And a lot of these areas up there, they'll take a um, they'll take a skidder or a tractor, and they'll punch roads out where they do certain clear cut areas to allow the loggers to get down for access for the logs where they've clear cutted. Well, we found one of these roads on this open area clear cut where the wood signs were, and this was a 
it's like a rolling hillside is what it was like. And we were all the way on the southeast side of this rolling hillside. And it was one of these roads that a skidder had punched out and laid gravel down to, um, to access log trucks to get there to get the wood. Well, we found a perfect slash pile in there that nobody had touched. Nobody, no, there was no sign of anybody being down in there. And, and mind you, on the way in this morning, and we went down there, when you get into Weber Road, you probably have to pass up, I'd say, about a good 15, 12 or 15 homes you pass up on Weber Road. And that's within an immediate, uh, I'd say it's within an immediate four or 500 yards off the road. And then once you're past that, you're out of the house area and now you're into the forest. Mm. So you got to figure we're about a good seven miles up past any houses at all, period. At, at least seven or eight miles up past the houses. We were pretty deep up in there. I didn't pass up. I don't recall passing up any hunters that morning, any vehicles, any other woodcutters. I think me and my buddy Troy were the first ones up there that morning. And when we found the slash pile, we parked our vehicles and it was right on this little hillside. And the slash pile was probably about... 15 feet up on the left-hand side of the road as we were driving down to it. And I thought to myself, this would be a perfect place to cut wood. We'll turn the trucks around because we're on a dead-end road, so we'll turn the trucks around. And then I can just cut wood or trade and cut wood, and we can just kick the logs down to one another. And uh, we can start splitting and cutting and stacking, and we can be out of here. So I decided to take first shift with cutting wood, and I grabbed my chainsaw, and I walked up this little hillside to uh, start cutting some wood. And I had just got probably about, I don't know, two or three logs cut and they were pretty, they were pretty good size. And I just got them cut and I just started kicking them down to my kid and my friend. Uh, and just as I did, and it was about seven o'clock in the morning when I was doing this. And it was, you know, it was one of those mornings where it's misty and foggy out. It's kind of dewy yeah. outside. It's cold because you're going into fall. And, and we were pretty much at the end of the clear cut on the Southwest side. Well, all of a sudden from my Northwest side or about the middle of this clear cut. And I got to say that this clear cut was probably about a good two square miles open where this mm. clear cut was at. All of a sudden I hear what sounds like little children giggling and laughing. Like if you were to walk out on a recess during lunchtime and you hear all the kids laughing and giggling out there, that's exactly what it sounded like. And it didn't sound like, anything that comes from a coyote or a fox. And I've had many people ask me about this and, and I'll tell you something else that also, that also sets the tone for me thinking what, it, what it was not was because of the fact that I've been in the wilderness quite a bit, not only, you know, riding dirt bikes and, and doing a bunch of cross country runs on dirt bikes, but hunting and fishing as well. I'm not too avid, but I at least get out once a year to go hunting and fishing, hunting, fishing. I'm pretty much out about at least a good dozen times a year. And I've seen bear in the wilderness. I've seen one cougar. I've seen a couple of foxes, which is pretty rare. And I have coyote hunted, coyote hunted plenty of times because I have friends of mine that have a cattle ranch in Eastern Oregon. So I've helped my buddy uh, coyote hunt out there to help control the coyotes on his cattle ranch out there. And I've never heard these sounds before. It just sounded like kids were giggling and laughing out there. And then all of a sudden, this sound just took off running or moving. I can't say running because I didn't see it. But the sounds of like, four or five little kids out there giggling and laughing and playing just took off across this clear cut. And I have to tell you, Dave, they t it took off so fast at a speed. I do not know any animal to travel that fast across this clear cut. And it went from one end of the clear cut to the other end of the clear cut. And then as soon as it got to the other end of the clear cut, which is probably about a good mile, mile and a half stretch, it mm -hmm. just disappeared. And the sound was just gone. And Troy heard it. My son heard it. And I looked down at those guys and they were looking at me and I asked Troy, I said, did you hear that? And he says, yeah, he goes, that was, he goes, that's another but coyotes out there. And I says, Troy, what, say, have you, first of all, he's a mechanic. He doesn't do a lot of outdoor stuff at all besides cut wood. And that's pretty much the only outdoor stuff he really does to really get out away from civilization. He camps and he goes riding quads, but he doesn't really get out and do any hunting. He doesn't do any fishing. So I know for a fact he does not have any experience with wildlife animals to understand the sounds of them. And I asked him, what, what wildlife animal do you know makes the sound of children giggling and laughing at 7 o'clock in the morning and the nearest house is about 6 or 7 miles down the road? You tell me this because any – I told him, I said, if, there is, if I was a parent, there would be no way in hell I'm letting my kid be out here at 7 o'clock in the morning by himself in hunting season – with woodcutters up here to be giggling and laughing and having a chance of being shot at, let alone getting lost or getting eaten up by 
a, a cougar or a bear because we're getting ready to go into winter, so they're going to want to hibernate, so they want to eat. There's just no way that kids will be up here, and it's not a fox and it's not coyotes. There's just no way. I just believe it. And my son looked at me, and he asked me the first words out of his mouth were because the truck was right next to me. He goes, Dad, you want me to get your gun? Because every time I go out there to go wood cutting or I go out in the wilderness, I always pack. I, I, I don't play around with not having something superior. Tell, tell me be superior if I have something that's higher in the food chain wanting to take me down. There's, I know, I just, it's just an uncomfortable feeling not having a weapon to protect yourself. Anyhow, uh, I, I didn't think as how, how fast this travel sounded across the clear cut. I, I didn't think there was any way on God's earth, my kid could get my gun and get it to me fast enough if this thing wanted to get to me. It moved so fast, Dave. I mean, I was ready to fire the chainsaw, not knowing what it was, if it was going to come in our direction. <laughs> Pray to God the chainsaw would help me so, out, you know? But I, I can tell you this much. It was probably about 1999 or 2000. I went to Eastern Oregon to my buddy's cattle ranch to go hunting with him. And I remember going from Prairie City to, or excuse me, from John Day to Prairie City. And it's about a 13 mile stretch of nothing out there. It's just complete darkness out there. Yep. And as I was driving about midnight going to his place, I remember seeing this fur ball jump out on the very edge of my high beams. I had some KC lights on my truck at the time and I had them on. I remember seeing this fur ball jump out on Highway 26 and it was running in the road. And I thought to myself, that's got to be a bear. And I was already going like 60 miles an hour. So I sped up and I got to within... I probably got it within about 60 yards, 50 or 60 yards of it. And I slowed back down and it was a bear running in front of my truck. And I was able to slow down and this, and this brown bear was running at 45 miles an hour. Now I've never seen a bear run that fast before. I've never even seen, I've, I've seen a bear take off and run because you startle them, but they usually go out of sight real quick. This bear stayed in front of my truck for at least a hundred yards after I'd already caught up to it. And then it decided to jump off to the left-hand side of the highway, jumped over a four-foot barbed wire fence and disappeared out to some farmer's field. And I thought to myself, wow, I can never outrun a bear. That was my reality check right there. If you're out in the wilderness, you better have something that can stop something quick because you can't outrun these things at all. Mm -mm. And when I was out there cutting wood that day and I heard that children's laughing sound run across the clear cut, it moved, I, I can guarantee it moved faster than the bear I saw running my truck a couple, you know, several years prior to that, there, it, it moved too fast. Yeah. That's not even like scary. That's like also spooky and really creepy. Just to yeah, have something exactly. flattling like that in the middle of <laughs> the morning is just like, uh, <laughs> that is I mean, crazy. how many, how many times? Yeah. You got kids, you got young kids. How many times have you heard them outside the back airplane or whatever? Oh, and they're yeah. laughing. And they're having a great time. They're giggling. That's exactly well, what I heard at 7 a.m. in the morning. Probably yelling at each other, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I got four kids. But you get, you get, what, I'm, you get yeah. what I'm saying, though. You know what I mean? No, you, just, I know. you just hear kids laughing and giggling. And you, it just sit. So, so what, what leads me to say that it's, it wasn't a bear, it wasn't uh, a coyote, it wasn't a fox, it wasn't any animal I know. I, I've even heard a, a, a cougar scream out in the wilderness i was i had the fortune one time of hearing a cougar scream about one o'clock in the morning uh being at my buddy's cabin out there elk hunting one night and and it said chills up your spine because he thought it was a woman being raped or murdered out there and my buddy's like nope that's just a cougar i was like wow he's like yeah he says it, it just basically killed something or it's on the it's on the hunt to kill something one of the two um but that's what he told me it was but anyhow what led me to believe what it wasn't that day I was out there cutting wood was I had a friend of mine that was probably 96, 97. He was at his dad's cabin um, down in Zigzag, which is probably about another 10 miles, 15 yeah. miles down the road from where we were cutting wood at. And his dad had a cabin up there and he was up there doing some, uh, he's a carpenter. So he's up there doing some remodeling work on some other cabins that were up there. Him and a, another friend of mine were. And it was wintertime, it was snow on the ground, and they were staying at his dad's cabin while they were doing uh, remodeling work up there this winter. And so about midnight, him and, him and uh, my buddy Ryan and my other friend Eric were up there watching TV, uh, watching a movie, and he said all of a sudden, his dad's back floodlights came on. He had, you know, the motion lights back there, and there were floodlights, and all of a sudden they came on, and my buddy Ryan was like, what, what's causing the floodlights to come on at midnight out in the middle of nowhere and it's snowing outside. So he goes back there to see if it was a deer or if it was a coyote or a cougar or any, who knows what it was walking across the back, but he goes, got to be an animal that set it off. So he wanted to go see what it was. He goes to the back door and he opens it 
And he says, as soon as he opens it, he says, just on where the light's not shining, you know how the light just dims out in the forest and you can't see much more. He says, right there where the light's not shining anymore, he goes, I heard a little kid that giggling and laughing. And I said, what? He goes, I heard little kids giggling and laughing. And he goes, Eric was by the TV. And after I opened the window, he said, Eric could hear it all the way on the couch, which is probably about 15 feet away from where the back door was. And Eric said, Eric looked at Ryan and he goes, who in the hell is up there kid back here at midnight in two feet of snow play in the snow up in the middle of nowhere. And Ryan said, he looked at Eric and he says, that, that ain't no kids. I don't know what it is but we're going to bed. So he said he shut and locked the door. They shut the TV off. (laughs) They went upstairs because it was a two story cabin. He said they grabbed his dad's guns. They loaded them and he said, we're just going to sleep. We're not doing nothing else but going to sleep and sleeping this one off. You know, personally, I I probably would have liked, I don't know, might've turned, I might've left the stuff on downstairs. Maybe that attracted it, you know, and then maybe go upstairs, crack a window open and listen and just kind of, you know, stay to the side a little bit, kind of peek out, see what's going on. But yeah, have the gun. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't. I, yeah, that's. I mean, when when we we talked about this, probably I want to say around two thousand two, two thousand three, because I was uh, living up in Corbett at that time, and my buddy Ryan was coming up and visiting me quite a bit because I had ten acres up there, and he always just liked to get out of the city and come relax with me. And we were up there just, you know, having a couple of beers one night and I had a little fire going. I was burning the burn pile outside and we were just BS. And then he told me about that and I was like, no kid. And he says, yeah, he goes, I heard little kids giggling and laughing. So when I had my experience in 2013 up there, I was just thinking, like, the, he was the first person I thought of. I'm like, man, Ryan, first thing I thought was Ryan wasn't lying. There's something out here and it's creepy, you know? Oh, wow. Like I said, I, I never, I never saw what it was and I, I don't know if it was a Bigfoot or not, because I don't know what their characteristics are. I don't know what their traits or habits are. I mean, but the only thing I can guarantee to tell you is it wasn't a bear. It wasn't a cougar. It wasn't a coyote or fox. Um, and I've heard, you, you know, know uh, me and you were at Beachfoot. I'll give you a couple books you might want to grab. First off, it's from William Jevening, that one right there. Uh, there's a new updated volume to this, but I like this cover the best. But this is uh, Notes from the Field, Tracking North America Sasquatch. But do you remember that gentleman um, at, uh, not Bob Gimlin, we both met him. Uh, we were at uh, yep. Beachfoot, um, this guy, the book, um, it's called Where Bigfoot Walks by Robert Michael Pyle, Robert Pyle. I had a chance to talk to him when I was out there, and I've had his book for almost 20 years, and I read it. I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, he's got an updated uh, edition coming out, guys, and it's actually out today, I think. I think it's out today, and um, basically, um, you know, that's, those are two really good books to read. Uh, I would try the William Jevening one if you've read read the other one by Mike by Pyle. Um, try uh, feel, uh, North America, uh, the Field Notes, basically, from William Jevening. I read that one. It gives you a really lot of good information, historical, and uh, also just some good, good information, real good information breakdown what so. information is good to have because uh you know i i, I can tell you two other incidences there real quick if we have time i could tell you two yeah, other stories yeah. Go that ahead. Happened to me. another 10 15 minutes here man <laughs> oh cool uh, and 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 these things that have happened to me you know when you start learning more about this because beachfoot was very informative to me super informative i I talked to so many people and it was like, wow, some of these things that have happened to me, maybe it wasn't what I thought or the, I don't know, it's just got answers for me. Uh, one of them was when I was living up there in Corbett and I was living up there with my ex and we had 10 acres all the way on the back of Trot Creek Road, uh, if anybody knows that area is at. And we were basically the second to last house before it was BLM forest up there. And we had, uh, we had 10, about 10, 10 and a half acres and then we had a neighbor next to us and then next to them was the forest and this was all east of us. Well, the driveway sat probably about 50 yards off the road, and then we had a house up there, and then the house was east of the driveway, and then the shop that I had up there was um, northwest of the house, probably behind it about 20 yards. You basically just walked out the back door and just walked diagonal about 20 yards to the shop, and then directly in front of the shop, if you were to walk out the front of the shop, which would have been east of the front doors, 
uh, which was directly behind the house, was a woodshed we had. And then behind that woodshed, we had a storage shed back there. And then next to my shop and the storage shed, we had nothing but forest up there. Uh, it was all 10 acres of forest. You could walk down to Gordon or Trot Creek, and Trot Creek would take you all the way up into BLM Forest. So we were pretty desolate up there. Yeah. And I had a dog that was a shepherd and a Rottweiler mix. He was about 140 pounds. He was a very big dog at the time. And he wasn't scared of too much. He chased a couple of bears off up there that we had come on the property when they were clear cutting. And there just wasn't much he was scared of. He was a super nice dog, but he didn't like other animals for some reason. So I never knew. I, I always knew I never had to fear anything coming around the house because he'd let me know. And one night I was out in the shop doing some work and it got late, about 11 o'clock or so. Uh, and it was, it was full. And I went to leave to shut the shop off to walk in the house. And behind the storage shed, that was the last shed that, that was behind that was nothing but forest. I just got done uh, a couple of days prior cutting and stacking some wood from a couple of trees that have fallen down due to the windstorms up there. And I probably had about two cores of wood stacked up behind the shed. And just as I was turning off my compressor and the floodlight in front of the shop to get ready to shut the door to walk to the house, something smacked the back of the shed and it smacked it. It, it just, it's like a baseball bat smacked the back of the shed. It was the loudest whack I had ever heard, you know, being that close to something like that. And, and I thought, what in the hell is over there? <clears throat> and as soon as I thought that, I didn't even have a chance to look down and my dog was already tail tucked ears back and he was sprinting to the back door of the house. And I thought to myself, well, that's a good sign to run. If the dog's scared, you better be scared too. <laughs> and I booked to the house. Uh, my ex was in the house at the time and I, and I told her what had happened and I went to grab my 30 out six, a flashlight and I was grabbing the dog to go back out there. And the dog was not wanting to go out the door. I literally had to grab him by his collar and that extra fur he's got in the back of his neck. And I was dragging him out there with me. Cause I'm thinking dog, <laughs> if, if there's something out here, we're going down together and you're going to help me out because I ain't going down alone. And I need a sniffer out here right now to see what's going on. But I remember getting him about 10 feet out the back door. That's as far as I could get him. I, I couldn't drag him much past that, but he, was putting up a fight like no other not wanting to go back there. And I was just curious what it was. When the next morning came and I walked out there, um, my wood pile was knocked over. I didn't see any sign of tracks anywhere. I didn't know what, I didn't know what, whatever it was that made that noise. I don't know if, if, if a hand smacked the back of the shed. I don't know if a baseball bat or I don't know what happened. I just know my wood pile was knocked down and the whole area was disturbed prior for me, you know, driving my truck back there and stacking wood. So I couldn't find any tracks, but it was the loudest whack I'd ever seen. And that morning I walked back there and my dog just seemed to be acting weird as he was sniffing around the pile. He just, I remember him just, he was almost like he was skittish yeah. when he was sniffing around the pile when I was walking back there. Uh, so that was one of the things that happened. That was probably, that was probably, uh, God, it had to have been right around 2000, 2001. And then just recently, my wife likes to go hiking quite a bit. And uh, we went hiking. She likes to go out into the gorge and do a lot of hiking trails out there. So we went out there hiking with a bunch of friends here about a year ago. And I can't remember the name of the trail. I think it was Starvation Creek was a trail we were on. It's about a 14-mile trail. Mm -hmm. And we were walking it. And I think we were the only ones. We, we, I think we ran across one or two other couple out there that day. And that was about it. But as we're in the middle of our walk and – all these trails on the gorge are on the uh, east, or excuse me, the south side of I-84, and we were walking westbound at the time, so basically the hillside, the trail we were walking on was on a hillside, and it was off to our left. Uh, you probably had about another two or three hundred yards to get to the top of the hill from the trail we were on. It was a pretty steep hill, and I was the last one in the pack, and as we were walking on the trail, I heard that same sound again sounded like someone took a baseball bat and whacked it up against the side of a tree. Just one hit, just one big whack. And me being the idiot I am not knowing what kind of sign that was and listening to Sasquatch Chronicles and all the Bigfoot shows I get my hands on, I grabbed the nearest down tree branch I could find and whacked it on the tree to see if I get a response. And it was nothing. I remember my wife turned around and she goes, well, you knock that crap off. We're not Bigfooting today. <laughs> I was like, I just want to see if I can get a response. Like, I heard a whack. You heard it too. <laughs> <laughs> nice. 
Nice. My wife is not a believer in this stuff, but she thinks I'm a loony tune sometimes for going off and doing some of the things I do. But she, she's not a believer, and I keep telling her the day you see this thing, that if you ever have an experience with me when we're out hiking, camping, riding, whatever it is we're doing, because I go to the areas where these things are. I mean, we just went to uh, Bowl of the Woods, which is out in the uh, uh, Huckleberry area, uh, the backside of uh, Clackamas, uh, Clackamas County area. It's about a good 14 mile round trip, uh, round trip hike. And that is a huge hot spot right now for Bigfoot activity from everything I've read up on and the stories I've heard. And I keep telling them you might get lucky and you might not, but the second you do, I said, I promise you, you're going to be, you're going to be apologizing to me for the rest of my life for thinking I'm the nut that believes in it because you've had an experience too. So uh, I'm just yeah. hoping it's, I'm just hoping it's a good experience. Nothing that makes her not want to go yeah. out, ever, out ever again to the wilderness, but who knows? We'll see. But you know, yeah. those are pretty much the experiences I've had. That's awesome, this, man. Thank you, you know? for sharing all that, man. That was awesome. Awesome. It was great meeting you up there. And uh, my wife and actually everybody was like planning on, uh, we're, we're actually planning on most likely going back there next year to Beachwood. That's I plan on being back there as well. Todd said Todd, Todd said I was more than welcome to come on back next year. So yeah, and so. it was actually good because I ran across a buddy of mine that um, I haven't seen forever. That was you know I haven't seen him in almost twenty years, and he actually had an experience up on St. Helens up there where the uh, he was trying to find the cabin that the miners had their experience in back in the what was the twenties that they had their experience up there where they got attacked by the Bigfoot. He was up in that area, he said, back in 2000 or 2001, and him and his girlfriend actually saw a Bigfoot up there as well. And he goes, it, it was a big guy. He said it was about a 9 or 10-foot tall guy. He said it scared the heck out of him and his girlfriend, and they got in the car and poked out of Dodge. Yeah, that's a uh, – yeah, I can imagine seeing the one you saw. That's 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 huge. I can tell you to this day that because of what I saw – my head is constantly on a swivel when I go outside. I just, it's just one of those things you can't get off your brain. It's one yeah. of those things that leaves a little bit of fear in the back of you. Every time you go out in the wilderness to just keep an eye out. Don't be stupid. Play it safe. Cause you never know what's out there. You just yeah. don't. It's, it's a monstrous world. Once you get out in the outdoors, it's yeah. bigger than people think it is. And, and I still believe to this day, because of the population that's grown in the cities and the technology, technology we have, it's leading to a lot less footsteps being in the outdoors, which is giving these creatures greater room to roam again because there's less people being out there in the wilderness like there used to be. That's yeah. just my philosophy on it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for being on here, man. That was awesome. And if uh, you guys have any questions for Brian or anything like that, go ahead and put them in the uh, comments and uh, he'll probably check it from time to time. I'm sure to see how it's all going on. But uh, yeah, oh yeah, uh, I'm know, always getting to answer questions. You know, meeting Pyle and and uh, Shane Corson, Gunnar Monson, uh, Todd Neese. Oh God, he was such a nice guy, um, and I really, really love his music choice. Um, <laughs> and Esther, Esther <laughs> yeah, it was great, wasn't it? Esther was so cool. She's one of those. She's an older lady who's been around this whole um, community since since the beginning, you know, and. Uh, and then meeting Bob and just having him hang out with my kids like that, and just them all having fun together was just awesome to watch and see. And just, it was awesome. So did you get a chance to meet uh, Peter Baru when you're out there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I met Peter and uh, gosh, who else? There was just so many people there. Um, but yeah, there was uh, a lot and of I got to, yeah, I got to sit down with uh, Ron Moorhead for a little bit. That was pretty awesome talking with him. Uh, the next morning after the uh, uh, the uh, Friday night stuff, I got to sit down with him uh, Saturday morning while we were all drinking coffee. So, uh, yeah. It was He's awesome. really cool, and he? he's got a lot of really interesting concepts and theories on this whole thing. He does. He does. Um, me, personally, I thought some were a little far-fetched. I'm not kind of that far out there. <laughs> um, I'm pretty much. <laughs> no, I'm, it lives, it breathes. It, it, it lives, lives and it breathes. lives and it breathes. It lives, it breathes, it eats, it poops, and pees. And, uh, yep. So for me, it's, you know, that's pretty much as far as I go with that. Um, but it was really great <laughs> just to hear what they, they think and what they believe about it and, and listening to some of their, uh, just their own experiences and everything else is just absolutely, it was just, abs you know, like you, it was just, for me, it was absolutely amazing too. So, you know, I've. Yeah, it was good times. 
Yeah, yeah. I was just, you know, kind of goofing around one day and wrote my story that I had, wrote my mom's and wrote a friend of mine's. And next thing you know, here we are with PacWest Bigfoot and people sending me, you know, and just so all of you guys out there know, um, these live interviews are actually for the kind of research end of this, the whole, you know, serious back end research stuff. The encounter stories are um, based on true accounts. They're true stories, man. And what I do is, you know, people will send me like, you know how some people are. They just kind of like, you know, I don't want, you know, I don't need the world knowing who I am or anything like that. Here is five or six paragraphs of what I experienced. And so then I create the stories around that backstory so that they're something that you can kind of read and freak yourself out with while you're out camping. You know what I mean? And for you yeah, researchers yeah, I get out what there, you're yeah, when the researchers, you guys, you researchers are out there and you got nothing going on during the week, you're in your work week, your middle of the day, and you just wish you were big footing listen to the encounter stories here they're all based on true stories so i hope you enjoy them with that man i am going to go enjoy the rest of the evening with my family and uh, god bless you and yours dude and it was great meeting you and uh actually i'm going to be putting together maybe a little something for uh oregon uh pack west bigfoot uh, uh group of some sorts um some sorts yeah and uh, i'll let you know what's going on with that because i'd like to kind of bring you in there so uh, I'll, I'll let you know what's going awesome. on. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Awesome, With that, awesome. man, uh, hold on one second, Brian. I'm going to, to the rest of you guys, thank you very much for being here. And I will talk with you guys uh, on the next uh, story. Thanks.